The Leadership Lecture Series is a program of the Institute for Leadership Studies, which is a leadership development center, and we are focused on seeking to facilitate positive organizational, societal, and individual change, and to engage our citizens and to be socially responsible leaders. Our mission is to really help people become better leaders, and we think that through these lecture series, we welcome leaders of all different kinds of disciplines and from a variety of perspectives. So each semester, we, we host public forums and actively engage in the community around socially relevant discussions, and we invite not only our students and faculty who are here this evening, but also the, our neighbors and our community members. The lectures are always in combination with a book signing, so it's a wonderful opportunity for our guests to have a chance to really get to meet these great leaders. But the program really became to, into prominence because of the wonderful partnership with Book Passage. And I wanted to thank both Bill and Elaine Petricelli, who are here tonight, and thank them so much for everything. <laughs> everything they have done in our community, without them, it really wouldn't be the same place. And with, with also without their support, these lectures would not be happening. I also want to thank the great publisher tonight who brought Sumant Kidd and, and Kid Taylor with us, which is Viking Penguin. And thank you so much tonight for bringing, bringing these great people to us. We also want to thank Marin Magazine, which is the lecture series media sponsor, and we really appreciate all that the support they provide to, to, to get your attention, and we really thank them for their, their support. I also wanted to just mention before we, we introduce our great speakers that we have a fantastic lecture series this semester. Journalist, activist, and author Barbara Ehrenreich is coming on October 23rd. I hope you mark your calendars. All of these events are at 7 p.m. We will also do a book signing that night, of course. Barack, uh, Barack Obama's presidential campaign manager, David Plouffe, is coming November 11th. And, he, of course, he was an enormous change agent in, in how he actually used social media to make a difference. Two days before that, Vice President Al Gore is going to be coming. And that particular lecture, there is a $40 charge. It includes a book. You can buy those books through Book Passage. I don't know, Elaine, if those are available tonight or not. They will always take our money. Good news. So please, please know that, that, that look, these events are, are just gems in our community, and we hope that you will put them on your calendar. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Susan Dixon, who comes from Salient Friedman Wealth Management. She is the chief operating officer there and a great friend. She is an MBA alumna of Dominican University, and she will, she will introduce to you our guests this evening. Please welcome Susan Dixon. Good evening, everyone. From her roots in a small town in southwest Georgia, Sue Monk Kidd grew up into a naturally gifted writer. And this was evidenced in her first novel, The Secret Life of Bees. She took a more traditional path, however, before she became a best-selling author. She majored in nursing at Texas Christian University, worked as a registered nurse, taught nursing in college, and married and raised a family. As she approached age 30, she was drawn to writing again while on a spiritual awakening. Her first book was God's Joyful Surprise in 1988. This was followed by When the Heart Waits. The Secret Life of Bees brought her worldwide acclaim. The novel about a southern teenager, her black housekeeper, and their relationship with three eccentric beekeeping sisters was on the New York Times bestseller list for more than 80 weeks and has been published in 20 languages. From 1988 to 2000, Sue, a former Baptist Sunday school teacher, traveled with her daughter, Anne Kidd Taylor, to sacred sites in Greece and in France. They shared their trials and tribulations, which resulted in traveling with pomegranates 
a mother-daughter story. Sue and Anne are here tonight to share their intimate dual memoir with us, and we are fortunate and grateful to have them. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sue Monk Kidd and Ann Kidd Taylor. We are very happy to be here. This is a beautiful campus and I think my first time in San Rafael. So I want to thank, I want to add my thank yous to um, Dominican University, to the Institute for Leadership Studies and the Women's Leadership Philanthropy Council and of course the Great Bookstore Book Passages. Thank you so much for bringing us here and I want to thank all of you for, for coming and for your presence tonight. Well, we're happy to talk about our new memoir. I think they're calling it a dual memoir. Um, Traveling with Pomegranates, a mother-daughter story, and read a couple of passages to you. Um, I see you were, you were subjected to the um, trip photos, weren't you? <laughs> um, we wanted you to get a feel for the book, uh, for the fee a feel for the the tone, the emotional content, and little windows into the um, book. Everything you saw, the images, the photographs, all figure into the story and the memoir in some way or the other. When people discovered that Anne and I were writing this book together, invariably, the first thing they would say to us would be, are you two still speaking? We got that response about nine times out of ten. I kid you not. And it became sort of funny and then revealing. It says a lot about the whole mother-daughter world and how loaded all of that can be. So given that, I felt like I should start by giving you the good news. <laughs> We're still speaking. <laughs> In fact, uh, I think that Anne and I would both say that writing this book together has deepened our relationship. I mean, it, we challenged one another. It was, it was a complex experience, but it was overall very deepening for us. It was also educational, as I told Anne. I learned things about her I did not know. Um, I learned, for instance, that on her college trip to Greece, she danced on a tabletop with a very handsome, apparently very handsome Greek student she had met on the sidewalk about an hour earlier. <laughs> so that was educational. And then um, I learned when we were writing this book that she ran from the idea of becoming a writer because I was a writer. And there was that need in the daughter to differentiate herself from her mother and carve out her own identity. So that was going on. That was also interesting. And when I handed Anne the first chapter that I wrote in the book, she read it and she said, I didn't know you were conflicted about motherhood. <laughs> I thought, well, I pulled that off really well <laughs> because there was always that uh, tension in me between writing and my own separate life and, and motherhood. So um, I revealed that in the book. So Anne f found that educational, I'm sure. And we had lots of opportunities to talk about things. You could argue, I think, that the mother-daughter relationship is one of, if not the most emotionally intense, conflicted, ambivalent, um, complicated, closest relationship on earth. Um, I want to read to you a, a line that I have carried with me a very long time. I read it many years ago. It's a line from the poet Adrian Rich about the mother-daughter relationship and I think it's one of the most beautiful and provocative pieces of writing on that I've, I've ever heard. She says, probably there is nothing in human nature 
more resonant with charges than the flow of energy between two biologically alike bodies, one of which has lain in amniotic bliss inside the other, one of which has labored to give birth to the other. The materials are here for the deepest mutuality and the most painful estrangement. And then there's what uh, Lillian Carter said. This is President Carter's mother. She said, sometimes when I look at my children, I say to myself, Lillian, you should have stayed a virgin. <laughs> she really said that. <laughs> And she produced a president. So I think all of this is probably to say that the mother-daughter relationship is rarely casual. It's rarely irrelevant, and it's rarely finished. Writing this book together was my idea, but I had absolutely no idea what I was getting into. Initially, I set out to write this book by myself, but after working on it for years, I came to realize that I was only telling half of the story. It just seemed to me that my mom's voice and my mom's story needed to be in there too. So not long after that, around my 27th birthday, I was talking with my mom and I heard myself say, why don't you write the book with me? And that was the spring of 2003 and my mom was gearing up to write The Mermaid Chair, so my timing was awful. But to my surprise, she said, I'd love to. And then she paused, and sounding very serious, added, but Anne, I want you to be really, really sure. And I was absolutely sure until she said that. <laughs> A few years ago, my mom had some quotations stenciled on the stairway that lead up to her, her study. I still read them from time to time when I go over there. The one at the very top is by French novelist Emile Zola and, and says, if you ask me what I came to do in this world, I as an artist will answer you. I am here to live out loud. It occurred to me that writing a book with my mother could mean living a lot louder than I'd ever thought. It can be fairly terrifying to make yourself audible in the world and to put your voice out there. And I did suddenly feel like I was jumping off the deep end. But I heard my mother say that she became a novelist by diving in over her head. She was always saying things like, if you're going to err, err on the side of audacity. So I thought, okay, let's write this book. Recently, however, I've discovered the only thing more audacious than writing a book together is going on book tour and living out loud right in person. <laughs> what Anne did not know is that it felt like jumping off the deep end for me too. I'd never written a book with anyone other than myself. Uh, I had no idea how to do that. I was saying things like, air on the side of audacity because you know, that's what I needed to hear. This is always what I have needed to hear in my life. And I have this theory that writers typically quote things and write things that they most need themselves. Uh, but we jumped off together and figured it out. It took three years to write this book which was only two years longer than we thought it was going to take or that it was supposed to take, uh, Anne figured this up, that we traveled for 40 days and it took 1,095 to write about it. So it was a lot longer. Um, we write about three trips that we took together over the course of three years to Greece and France, Turkey, and then back to Greece. Um, I wrote at my house, Anne wrote at her house, 15 minutes apart. After we had mapped out a vision for the book, uh, we would just write our chapters separately. And then we'd come together and we'd sit in my study and we would hand one another the chapters and then we'd sit there and read. The first time 
that we exchange chapters, chapters one. I noticed, and Ann noticed, that we had each written a little description of one another. Now, you don't get to see yourself through your daughter's eyes in writing all that often, or your mother's eyes, I suppose, that suddenly occurred to me. And I think we were kind of fascinated and intrigued with what one another had written, taken care to actually put in the book. Um, we thought we'd read these short descriptions to you. And um, I feel like I should warn you before we read them that they are embarrassingly positive. <laughs> and I think we can do it because <laughs> there is no lack in this book for unflattering and deprecating and brutally honest descriptions of ourselves, which we are in invariably writing ourselves. So here's what I wrote about Anne and it is actually um, brutally honest, too. If you ask me to describe Anne, the first thing I would say is smart. Her intelligence was never just scholastic, though. It always had a creative, inventive bent. When other eight-year-olds were busy with lemonade stands, Anne set up a booth for dispensing advice for people with problems. Minor problems cost a nickel, major ones a dime. She made a killing. On the other hand, it must be said that Anne's defining quality is kindness. I don't mean politeness so much as tender-heartedness. Growing up, she railed against animal abuse and was unable to bear even the thought of a squashed bug, insisting we carry all insects from the house in dustpans. Indeed, Whatever her sensitive and fiery heart attached itself to, she was passionate about it. Bugs, dogs, horses, books, dolls, comic strips, Save the Earth, movies, Hello Kitty, and Star Wars. Before I read what I wrote about my mother, I want to mention that we both kept a quotation on our desk while we wrote this book. It's by the poet Anais Nin and says, the role of the writer is not to say what we all can say, but what we are unable to say. And this passage I'm going to read had that feel to it, like it was something I had been unable to say to my mom. Sitting beside the Parthenon, I spot my mom in the distance, taking pictures of the sculpted columns of women on the porch of the Caryatids. She wrote about the Caryatids in her book, The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. She described them as an, an embodiment of strong women bearing up. Women who bear the weight of opposition, she wrote, create a shelter for the rest of us. The Dance of the Dissident Daughter was published my sophomore year in college. When I opened it and saw it was dedicated to me, I read it like a mother's letter to her daughter, daughter, sometimes forgetting her story was being read by thousands of other people. At times it seemed beyond weird that we lived in the same house during those years. I'd known so little about what she struggled with inside. Mostly I knew her as my mother, the one who stayed up half the night decorating my Raggedy Ann birthday cake, who indulged me by creating the Coke Pepsi challenge in the kitchen for Bob and me, who helped me pick out my black cotillion dress, who taught me how to parallel park at the DMV. But when I finished The Dissident Daughter, I glimpsed her for the first time as a woman, like one of those beautiful caryatids she's standing with now. That was very lovely for me to read that for the first time. I think that moments when a daughter glimpses her mother outside of that scripted role of motherhood and sees her as a woman, it really can open up the relationship like a little breakthrough. And that's goes the same for a mother glimpsing her daughter, not just as her daughter, but in some other way. The truth is, Anne and I never had one of those um, pyrotechnic relationships that are written about so often and famously in books. Uh, we did have what I would call the classic struggle of mothers and daughters. I thought I would try to articulate what that struggle is the way I understand it anyway and the way it's often expressed in uh, depth psychology. On one hand, uh, you have a mother 
who's trying to let her daughter go from the time she's very small even, while unconsciously seeing her daughter as an appendage of her own self. So it's a very interesting and conflicted kind of thing going on in a hidden way inside. And then you have the daughter who is wired to pattern herself in her mother's image and please her mother, but she's equally wired to separate from her mother and differentiate herself. And as I said earlier, to kind of create her own identity. So those two things are sort of clashing together too. When the book opens, it is 1998. I am turning 50 years old. And Anne is graduating from college, and these two things are happening the very same summer. And so I came up with this really extravagant plan that we would go off to Greece together to mark these two milestones in our lives. However, this classic struggle that I tried to describe was really becoming stirred up in our lives for the very reason of those milestones. Sometimes these transitions in our lives sort of kick that struggle into high gear. So I think we were definitely at a crossroads. In a way, uh, we had outgrown the relationship, the one where I'm the mommy and she's the little girl. And we both sensed the finality of that, but we had not figured out how to shift the conversation into a new relationship. Uh, so it was during this very first trip to Greece that it dawned on me very forcibly that we were going to have to reinvent the relationship. And we had not been in Greece very long at all when we bumped into this myth of Demeter and Persephone. It is about a mother, Demeter, who is starting to age a little, and her daughter, Persephone, who's on the cusp of young womanhood. When the daughter goes missing, her mother mounts a passionate search to find her. And in the end, there is a reunion. It is essentially a story about loss, search, and return. And I think we were surprised to realize it was our story, too. We would like to read two brief passages that highlight that mother-daughter relationship and the old motif of loss, search, and return that runs through it. But the readings also touch on a second major theme in the book, which is about crossing thresholds of womanhood but at two ends of life. I was trying to figure out the beginnings of being a woman, and my mom was trying to figure out the beginnings of the ending of it. She describes her transit into older womanhood, which had a sort of turbulence. And you could say that my passage into young womanhood was not smooth sailing either. I think a lot of young women right out of college are grappling with those large questions and with what to do with their lives. They're trying to understand who they are inside, what they believe, looking for independence, navigating relationships, kind of an all around what it means to take on life. Um, the summer after I graduated from college, I know I was pretty confused and lost. I actually had no idea what to do with my life. I'd had a pretty big disappointment uh, that had left me feeling like a failure. I remember writing in my journal one day, I'm 22 and I'm a failure. So for the first time in my life, I was depressed. This first passage takes place on our very first trip together, aboard a ship docked off the coast of Turkey. Up until this point, I've been withholding a great deal from my mother, or well, pretty much all my feelings from my mother. As I wrote in the book, every day was an acting class. I could not seem to tell her what I was going through. And I felt a kind of partition between us, a kind of invisible room divider that marked our space. I just did not confide personal matters to her, my inner thoughts. In other words, the very particulars of my soul. I think I wondered, what do you tell your mom? And what do you tell your best friend? But this conversation changed all that. It actually became a turning point in our relationship. So picture mom and me sitting on the deck of the ship at a table beneath a big blue umbrella. And it's all very congenial and nice and very well partitioned. 
when out of nowhere I unintentionally say something that hints at the state I'm in. And I'm going to pick up right there. Mom adjusts her chair so her eyes are out of the sun, then takes off her sunglasses. She looks at me, seriously looks at me. Her eyes are locked on mine, the expression of someone who knows she has happened upon a moment of impending truth and is not about to retreat from it. What do you mean, Anne, she says. I press my fingers against the corners of my eyes and decide I will not cry. I stare at my napkin, blue like the umbrella. As soon as I look up, Mom will finally know how sad I am, and I won't be able to spare her anymore. I force myself to meet her brown eyes. She gives me a small, sad smile. For one or two seconds, I can tell she sees me in a way I cannot see myself. My eyes fill and her face goes blurry. I fight for composure. If I start to cry, I'm afraid I won't finish till the ship docks again in Athens. She reaches for my hand. It's okay, just tell me, Mom says. Suddenly, the words are in my mouth and I'm saying them. I'm just depressed. Her fingers tighten on mine. I knew something was going on, she says. I'm sorry, I should have asked you about it. When did all this start? When the letter came, I tell her. She wrinkles up her forehead. The letter, the grad school letter, the one confirming my inadequacies. I hear the smart ass tone in my voice, but for some reason it helps to keep me from falling apart. But that was last March, she says, and her eyes widen. For the next hour, it all pours out the whole miserable thing. What it was like the day I got the letter, how I hid it in my sock drawer, the way things went from bad to worse, the depression taking over. I tell my mom how afraid I am inside, how lost, how rejected I feel, how the letter had unearthed my own self-doubt and feelings of unworthiness, then the shame that I was not good enough. I cannot hold back anymore. I drop my head on the table and cry. I feel mom's hand on the back of my head and I cry harder. It is whole minutes before I can stop. I use the napkin to wipe my nose. The wait staff is having a whispered conversation that I can only imagine. Crazy girl on deck, call the ship's doctor. Mom scoots forward in her chair. Now she knows. Anne, listen to me. I understand how the rejection letter snowballed into a rejection of yourself and how depressed you became. But all those things you love about Athena that you found in yourself before, they're still in you, I promise. They just seem lost to you right now, okay? I nod. I know mom wants to say the right thing to me. I can see how hard she's trying, going slowly, measuring her words, her eyes brimming. I want to tell her she doesn't have to say anything, that her hearing all this is what matters. But then she says, you deserve to love yourself. And it hits me suddenly how true that is. As Anne said, um, a significant narrative thread throughout the book is about the transitions we both found ourselves in. For me, at 50, uh, I could feel the young woman packing up in the other room. She was leaving. I could just hear it. I could see it. I could feel it. Just as I could sense Anne leaving, I could feel um, my own young woman leaving. It's a sort of cruel trick of timing sometimes, how that all comes together. Those were the days, as I wrote in the book, that I would uh, look in the mirror and study the, the new sags and lines that were coming into my face like a seismologist studying unstable tectonic plates. It felt like they were happening that fast. Um, but it wasn't just, you know, the physicality of it, the changes, these very dramatic changes that were happening in my body and my appearance. It was also apparent to me in the way I was suddenly having all these thoughts about my mortality. Where was that coming from? It's the first time in my life that I was really thinking about that. 
it was uh, apparent to me in this irrepressible need I had to leave my old geography and move to a, a new place, which looking back, I feel like had to do with um, trying to find a new landscape inside. It was uh, also apparent to me that she was leaving um, in this inability I had to write in the same way. It was like my writing had just sort of gone to seed. Um, I, I felt like uh, I couldn't generate, well, I had a fear at least, that I couldn't generate this third act, you know, we all want, that there was something out there, but I didn't quite know what it was. So I think it was evident in a lot of, a lot of ways like that. I, I think um, that, well, let me put it like this. I realize that 50 is the new 40. <laughs> I have heard about this. <laughs> and, and I think that's great. But beneath the rhetoric of that, I sensed that something was ending and that something else wanted to begin. That there really was a kind of portal to pass through some crossing over into being this older woman. And what did that mean? And how do you navigate that from a deeper perspective other than just the body and the physical appearance and menopause and all of those things? What does the soul need? What is that odyssey the feminine soul wants to make at some point, maybe at different times for different women, 50 or 55 or 60 or, or some other age. But those were the kinds of questions that were emerging in me. And it seemed to me that I had to start with acknowledging the loss, the necessary loss that I was actually feeling and, and not try to um, put some sort of spin on it. So this passage that I want to read, which is about the mother-daughter relationship, but also about this transition in my life, you'll see me, I think, in the early phase of trying to deal with necessary loss. Don't let me wear pink to your wedding, I say. You see what I've got on there. Um, Anne and I sit at a table in the cafe before the Louvre Museum's glass pyramid and talk not about all the sublime art we've just seen, but about wedding outfits. Not powder blue either, and no jacket with shoulder pads. I promise, says Anne. Her wedding date is set, June 3rd, seven months away, but we've already spent a lot of Sunday afternoons making wedding plans. As I tell my friends, I have rented the tree. I love that she picked out a 500-year-old moss-laden oak to be her church. We have a guest list of 120, which is about all the people we can fit beside it. She will walk down a path to the tree that cuts through a rose garden. Floral arrangements would be redundant. I am sincerely happy about the wedding, and I adore Scott. But several times since Anne called me with the news, I felt a small wrench at the back of my heart when I think about it. I know it isn't about her. It's about me. But I don't know precisely what the feeling is. A longing, a sadness, the baton passing again. I'm eating some sort of sandwich that I fear could be spread with goose liver. I push it aside and drink my demipression. My mind goes to the classic moment in the tale of Snow White when the mother is eclipsed by the daughter. The queen consults her magic mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? She expects to hear a, her own name called as usual, but her stepdaughter has recently become a young woman and the queen is getting crow's feet. Snow White, the mirror blurts and zap. The queen has dealt her first shock of age. Perhaps all mothers of daughters possess a secret talking mirror that announces when their young womanhood begins to fade and their daughters begins to blossom. As in the fairy tale, the experience can unleash a lacerating jealousy in some mothers, which turns up like poison apples on the daughter's doorstep. 
It can also usher in fears that I would have sworn I'd never have of invisibility, anonymity, irrelevance, and deeper down, fears of decline and death. That night in the hotel bathroom, I stand at the sink, exhausted, tired from the flight and the walking. I just want to go to bed. I squirt toothpaste onto my toothbrush, and when Anne appears in the doorway with her cosmetic bag, I step over to make room at the sink. We stand side by side and brush our teeth before the mirror. I gradually become aware that despite my fatigue, I am watching her face. Miro, Miro. She is so beautiful. When I look back, it is clear that Mom and I both were on a spiritual and creative quest. Writing, creativity, and spiritual renewal are certainly motifs in the book as well. The book covers the period that Mom was discovering the Black Madonna, grappling with becoming a novelist, and then writing The Secret Life of Bees. And I was discovering what I've come to call my triptych of icons, the Greek goddess Athena, Mary, and Joan of Arc. And I was also waking up to the seemingly crazy notion that I might become a writer myself. The final two passages we would like to read focus on the writing aspect of our individual searches. To set up my reading, I should probably say that in the aftermath of my rejection from graduate school, I was really struggling with what to do with my life. I was looking for what I thought of as my necessary fire, some work with which I had a deep compatibility and true affinity, which also had the ability to bring me alive. This piece occurs during our second trip. It is raining, the cold, wet pellets hitting hard against the windows, and the road is slick and black. We are on our way to Font de Gomme to visit a 15,000-year-old cave. The thought of being underground inside a cave makes me uneasy. Apparently, it has a gallery of art inside, wall paintings by late prehistoric people. I imagine them in there, drawing by torchlight while woolly mammoths roam around outside. I remember being in an art history class and seeing several slides of paintings from the Lascaux Cave, which is not far from here. The horses in the slides look flat and primitive, stirring nothing in me like the images of ancient Greek sculpture had. I understand the paintings in Font de Gomme are renowned, but unless one of them depicts Wilma Flintstone vacuuming with an elephant trunk, I don't expect to be blown away. After a short climb from the bottom of the valley up a rock-crusted hill, we, we reach the cave opening. Our French guide, who has a red bandana tied around her hair, turns on her flashlight and leads us inside. Watch your step, she calls. I flip on my flashlight. There's enough oxygen down here, isn't there? I ask Mom. I guess, she says. She guesses? I was kind of joking around, and she guesses? The group gathers around a frieze where five well-preserved bison are painted on vanilla-colored limestone. The guide flicks on two cigarette lighters beside the painting. As the flames wave, the animals seem to come alive. Shadows cut back and forth, creating an uncanny image of running bison. The animals were drawn firmly, and without the slightest hint of hesitation, the guide says. As I listen to her wax on about the confidence of the cave painters, I consider my own lack of it. I stare at the bison. Whatever it is I'm born to do, my fear of failing at it has almost become greater than my desire to figure out what it is. I remember my prayer to Joan of Arc in the chapel at Notre Dame. I want to know what I was born for. I want the courage to do it. I feel like I've been spinning my wheels stuck between the need I have to blaze my own path, doing something that doesn't resemble my mother's work, and the inclination I have towards writing. I've treated writing a little like the rebound boyfriend, a fling not to be taken seriously. I've resisted writing because I thought there had to be more to it than these impulses I keep having, or the fact I enjoy doing it, or even the belief I might become reasonably good at it. 
But now I'm wondering if all these things are the very ways my true self speaks. Writing, growing up, it's all I wanted to do. Now I feel the way it pulls at me, not like a dramatic allurement, but like I've been away from home and have returned to the quiet things I love. As I alluded, I was definitely in a creative vacuum when we set out on these three journeys. I had been harboring this desire to become a novelist, but I had not acted on it. It was a passion, and it was a real impulse from my soul, and I think I was trying to find some kind of clarity, uh, to really kind of step up and do it. Now, I was also carrying around this seed of an idea for a novel about a girl who had bees that lived in the wall of her house. But I was vacillating about that too. I think I was looking for not just clarity, but probably looking mostly for courage. So I wasn't erring on the side of audacity. I was really erring on the side of safety when we left. But during the first trip we took, I had an experience that began to truly crystallize for me this path that I knew I would take. Um, and I want to I read a portion of that to you. At, when this happened, actually, um, I never looked back after that. I was not aware the Virgin Mary had a house anywhere, much less in the woods on the summit of a mountain in Turkey. Supposedly, she lived out her days there as an old woman. The house is tiny, L-shaped, made of sand-colored stone with high windows and two petite rounded domes on the roof. We sit on a stone wall beside the door to wait our turn to enter. I slide my hand to the hollow of my neck and feel the sterling silver bee charm on my necklace. I bought the bee six or seven months ago for no reason except I felt drawn to it. Maybe the pull I felt was simple nostalgia. When I was growing up, bees lived inside a wall of our house, making honey that sometimes leaked out onto the floor. The wall would hum. Sometimes the house would hum. After I told Mary in the myrtle tree that I wanted to be a novelist, I came home and wrote a chapter about a girl whose bedroom wall is full of bees that slip through the cracks and fly around at night. I even took it off to a writer's conference where the teacher pronounced it interesting. The despised, dreaded word. Suggesting its potential as a novel was small. Small. At times, I still hear his voice in my head saying the words. I walk through the last room and out the side door. The brightness hits my eyes, a shattering kind of light after the dimness in the house. Anne waits beneath a tree. I was about to come look for you, she says, very motherly, strapping on her backpack and striding toward me across the yard. As we walk toward each other, a honeybee lights on my left shoulder. I come to an abrupt stop, watching it from the corner of my eye. Perhaps this visitation is nothing, but it feels purposeful. As Anne approaches, she reaches out reflexively to wave the bee away, and I put up my hand, shaking my head as if to say, no, it's a bee. She steps back as she remembers our conversation, and the connection dawns in her face. Oh, she says. We stare at the bee, trying to be stock still, glancing at one another, making surprised faces. The bee is a mystery, a metaphor, a pure synchronicity. I tell myself it is the imaginative eloquence of Mary. Minutes go by, five, six, perhaps more. It occurs to us we could miss the bus. We walk down the hill. The bee rides along. What's with this bee, Anne says, genuinely affected? It's like it has adopted you. I look at her. I'm going to write the novel about the bees, I say. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Good evening. I was hoping, um, Sue, you could touch upon your relationship with the Black Madonna. Maybe just explain a bit more about that. Um, the Black Madonna, yes. Well, when we were traveling in Greece, I bumped into this beautiful dark-skinned uh, Madonna in an icon, and I was really entranced with it. Um, I think the surprise of these travels for me was um, becoming sort of captivated by the Virgin Mary again, as um, particularly in her guise as the Black Madonna. I mean, this was something I absolutely did not see coming. Um, I grew up Protestant. Mary had very little relevance in my world and in my life. Um, in fact, I probably had more of a negative connection to her than anything, to be honest. Um, she was mostly just a, a non-persona for me. But on this trip, um, I was struck by the power of these icons. I think that what icons are meant to do is to start up a conversation inside of you. And that's exactly what this icon did for me. It started a conversation. The first thing I did was to go through my history with Mary and think about that. Um, and then I began to take in this image and her, her stories, her mythology, her um, symbolism, her history, and kind of what her meaning was. Um, my feeling was that the Black Madonna, which I later discovered very powerfully in France, where there are probably more Black Madonna images than any other country, um, I discovered that um, she has an interesting family tree. <laughs> Let's put it like that. She has connections to the great Earth Mother as well as the Virgin Mary, and she kind of bridged something very interesting. And I began to realize that she's very well poised for 21st century feminist interpretation. Um, she's also poised to start a conversation inside about compassion, about a kind of radical diversity and inclusion about the earth, about our relationship to the earth, believe it or not. I mean, she, this is all inherent in her symbology and in her historical meanings. Um, but more than anything, she became like a muse to me. And I think it was through her iconography and her meaning that I began to get in touch with these deeper layers of creativity in myself. But she also has a lot of authority. You know, she looks right at you, direct gaze. Um, there's no downturned eyes or dipped chin in the black majana. She carries a lot of power and a lot of voicing of, um, I think the feminine voice comes through strong. So those are some of the meanings. And I began to uh, grasp that as we were traveling and began to study her and research her. And then of course she ended up getting a real starring role in The Secret Life of Bees. <laughs> um, though I, I tried to transform her into a black Madonna of the American South, kind of indigenous to where I live. Um, but that's a little of my relationship with her, and I kind of track that relationship um, in traveling with pomegranates, actually. Hi, Sue. It's great to see you tonight. Um, and I especially appreciate, I came because, even though I know you through the Black Madonna, I came to really applaud and thank you for this book about with you and your daughter, which is something I've always wanted to do with my daughter who wouldn't think of it. So I haven't read the book yet, I can't comment, but I'm just thrilled and want to thank you both so much for sharing whatever it is I'm going to discover. I bought an extra copy to send my daughter. Thank you very much. It's so good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I, I was wondering, a question for both of you, what the favorite parts of each of your trips were? Uh, just one favorite part. Um, Athens. <laughs> and perhaps that is because that is where I first danced on a tabletop. <laughs> so it, whole, it has a very special place in my heart. But um, yeah, I joke about that. But Athens was actually the place where I 
came to know myself and see myself as part of this great, big, wonderful world. And, you know, I suppose it's a cliche. People say, oh, I went to Greece and it changed my life. But there's a reason that that's a cliche. It's because there's so much truth to it. So it has to be Athens for me. Yes, that's a challenging question. I mean, we visited some really amazing places. Some of the obvious places you have to go if you're a tourist. We were tourists, but we were also pilgrims. And that, um, you know, we went on a quest, we thought, to celebrate these milestones. And then it turned into something so much more than we thought. But, um, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of this convent on the island of Crete. It's called Pagliani. Um, Pagliannis, I think, is how you say it. I have no idea how you say it, but that's how I'm saying it. <laughs> and um, it actually means old in Greek. But in that walled convent, which has been around for a very long time, um, at least a thousand years, there is a myrtle tree. And propped up in the branches of this myrtle tree is an icon of uh, this virgin of the myrtle. And um, she's, it's striking to sort of come upon uh, uh, Mary in the tree, you know. So uh, I think that place has a real resonance for me because it was there that um, I asked Mary, as I, as I mentioned in this reading, um, I told her that I wanted to be a novelist. And it was my first confession of that. And it was to her. So Anne and I went back to this convent together. And um, Anne made her own confession to Mary there, which is the why, reason we have this book, actually. Um, so I would probably have to say that place because I feel a real heart connection. But, you know, we ended up on an island called Gavrani off the coast of Brittany inside a prehistoric um, tumulus which is a burial chamber that was extraordinary. We ended up um, in the sanctuary of Demeter and Persephone in the ruins at Elefsina where we ate pomegranate seeds together. Um, it, so it's hard to pick. And then, you know, I have to say, uh, the Black Madonna of Rocamador just blew me away. I mean, she, I keep her image on my desk and, um, it was there I felt like I met myself. So just through that connection with her or met the self I wanted to become, let's put it like that. Um, I don't want to stand up because I'm too comfortable. Anyhow, um, <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for your book, The Secret Life of Bees. I meet with some women, we call ourselves the bees because it's a spiritual group. And we formed because we all read the book at the same time, so thank you. And um, the queen bee here says that we've been, how many years have we been? About seven years we've been meeting. We have drones who bring food and the queen who's in charge for the night. It's really fun, great wine. And Anne, what a blessing um, to start your life like this. How lucky you are to have a mother and a daughter relationship. But I, you know what? I'm not quite catching the traveling with pomegranates. Why did you choose that title? Perhaps I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. So if you could explain that, please. Let me start. Um, well, we take the pomegranate directly from the Demeter Persephone myth, which is the, as my mom said, the perhaps the oldest or only mother-daughter myth. Um, and it plays pretty figuratively in that myth. You know, Persephone is abducted and taken into the underworld, and when she eats those pomegranate seeds, it changes everything. Um, so we ate pomegranate seeds there, um, and that became, that took on different meanings for us, I think, and a shared meaning. But the pomegranate is about fertility and um, transition and acceptance. Um, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, you know, we, we did literally travel with pomegranates. They were in our suitcase. Um, yeah. We're actually traveling with pomegranates right now, with one in each of our suitcases. Um, but we kept bumping into them. I think we fell into that myth of Demeter and Persephone, and we recognized it was our story. And um, the pomegranate has to do with finding our 
the daughter finding her own separate life and independence. And for me, it was a real symbol of fertility. So um, we both adopted it and traveled with it. It turns up over and over in the book. <laughs> And I was able to bring in uh, and share with the men uh, the secret life of bees. And what? Can you hear me? No, I don't, no. Anyway, I just wanted to thank you for them, those, those men that are, weren't able to come, are not able to come, and to tell you from them how much they loved that book and how much it, it meant to them. And the good news is, is that uh, in the next couple of weeks, they're going to show the movie, so they will be able to see the movie. <laughs> Of, of your book. So I just well, that's thank lovely. You. Thank you very much for telling me that, and please convey my um, my greetings to them and my gratitude. Yeah. yeah. You said you grew up in a Baptist household, but when I was reading *The Secret Life of Bees*, I said a Catholic wrote this book. <laughs> but I'm reading. I've read other books that you've written, and you have such a breadth of spirituality. I feel and psychology and so where did all this come from? I mean, in your education or? Well, <laughs> the breadth of that question, I have to pause a minute and, and because it's, it's a large question and I couldn't possibly do it justice, but um, I grew up in a kind of moderate Bab Southern Baptist home in Georgia in a small town. Um, when I was in my 20s, I read um, Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain. It's almost a cliche, you know, that we Protestants read that and discover something. <laughs> but it, um, it was transforming for me because it opened me to the interior life. And um, then I began to read Merton voraciously. I, I would go on, I would make pilgrimages to um, Gethsemane, his monastery. So I think the contemplative writers in the Christian tradition became important to me. Um, and then uh, I stumbled into the work of C.G. Jung in my 30s, mid-30s, and began to read Jung. And that opened up another world for me. And I, you know, I read Jung's work, but I also read um, commentaries about Jung, and then I did a nine-year Jungian analysis. But I guess I, you ask about where does that come from? I, I mean, I think it's, um, it was just my search, you know, my hunger to, um, to find out about the spiritual life within and without and to experience that and to um, embody that. And then later, um, just as I was turning 40, in my early 40s, um, I had a kind of feminist spiritual awakening, you might say, and I wrote The Dance of the Dissonant Daughter. But it was like I, n I never left any of these aspects. I just pulled them along with me and felt like there was always an integration going on of, of just expanding. And I think, you know, my take is that the spiritual life is this evolution of consciousness and expanding the soul and the heart into more and more compassion and understanding. So that's how I see it. So I keep aspiring to, to do that, you know, like all of us. Hi. Um, this is kind of relevant. I, I was, um, last week when I saw this event being advertised, or there was an article about you in the Marin IJ that I saw. <laughs> And I thought, that sounds great, because I love The Secret Life of Bees. And then I realized that tonight was the first night of Rosh, was Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish New Year, and I happen to be, I'm Jewish. And I thought, oh, darn. You know, that's, <laughs> I want to go there, and I want to do this. And um, as it turned out, my family, my children, and my ex-husband, we decided to do a very early dinner, because everybody had something else they wanted to do next. And I, <laughs> I wasn't going to promote that, but everybody else did. And I said, gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> I get to do that and do this. And I think what I want to thank you for is that there's just a, well, talking about the pomegranates, 
I didn't think about this until somebody asked you that question, but the pomegranate is a symbol of this holiday, this Jewish holiday, for the Sephardic Jews. I'm not Sephardic, but when I look through my cookbooks, a lot of the recipes of the salads and chicken and things that you make um, include pomegranates. So today when I went shopping to make the salad, I bought the pomegranate and you <laughs> sprinkled, I sprinkled the seeds on the salad. And I think it represents, you know, I can't remember, I, have, I read it in the cookbooks years ago, but I do think it represents the f fertility. And I just mm -hmm. wanna, it's just wonderful being here and sharing the universality of also the icons. You know, I'm, I love the fact that you reveal icons and bring that to us. And I respond to all the spiritual icons. It doesn't matter what it is. And I just thought it was significant to be here tonight on a Jewish holiday <laughs> with the pomegranates here and there. And yeah. just want to thank you. And it's wonderful to be here, you know, at this college as well. Yeah, that's lovely. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being part of this. Thank you to Ann Kid Taylor and Sue Monk Kid for all the wonderful hours of reading. Those of you who have not yet read Traveling with Pomegranates are in for such a treat. If you have thought of about four more people the way my friend Denise did as she listened to the lecture, who you would love to give this book to, Joanna's here. You can buy them as you go through the line. And we're going to line up this way, and we'll help get posted so you can have them signed to you or to anyone you'd like. And I just, uh, this book is going to be number 10 on the New York Times bestseller list in the next uh, week. And after tonight, it's going to be number one. Thank you so much. <laughs>